as you have probably noticed from the title, this episode is not Bob Simple Part 2. That episode will appear here next week. But if you desperately want to hear the rest of Simple's story, you can hear it on the Happy Hour History Podcast right now. By the looks, the Simple episode is the most popular episode we have had yet, based on the numbers. So hopefully, many of you are looking forward to Part 2. Don't be concerned though, I still have a weaving episode for you, with the next one coming in two weeks, as promised. Let's head back to pre-European Aotearoa. Kia ora, g'day and welcome to the history of Aotearoa New Zealand. Episode 23. Does this kākahu make my butt look big? This podcast is supported by our amazing patrons, such as Nicholas and Oob. If you want to support Hans, go to patreon.com slash history Aotearoa. Last time we talked about weaving, we started our journey by looking at how to process harakeke, New Zealand flax, to extract the muka fibre and dye it to make it ready to turn into a useful item. We also talked a bit about the different types of weaving, raranga, fatu and firi. This time, we will look at those useful items. What are they, how they were made, and what they meant to Māori then and now. So, we have our flax, or muka, and we want to start turning it into something. We have already briefly mentioned about the various things that Māori would have turned it into, but let's start with items that aren't garments. Fishing was obviously a big part of Māori daily life and diet, whether that be in Moana or Awa, that is, ocean or river. A system of knots was often used to make nets for fishing by tying knots continuously, with new lengths of flax being added as each strip became too short, a technique which was employed all over Polynesia as well. Like all weaving, the spacing was done with fingers and by eye, so the experience of the weaver counted for a lot. Often different whānau were responsible for making different parts of the net that would be joined later under strict tapu and the supervision of a tohunga. Some nets were actually community items that would feed the whole hapu, and as such, these nets could get quite big. The largest ever recorded was made in 1886 by 400 people of the Ngāti Pikau iwi in the Bay of Plenty. Measuring about 1.6 kilometres long, it was only used once to catch tens of thousands of fish for a tribal gathering. Not all nets were as monstrous as this though, some were just small hand nets. And the knotting technique was also used to make mesh bags to hold stones for sinkers on fishing lines and traps. There was also a technique of making nets that didn't require knotting, called looping, which involved making loops around the thumb and little finger, drawing the entire cord through the loop. This may have sometimes required the use of a small needle to aid in getting the loop nice and tight, unlike other weaving which was all done by hand. This was primarily used to make the nets of poi, which were totally enclosed nets filled with tahuna, sand, to form a tight ball. This sand-filled ball would be attached to a cord, which could then be swung around in a dance which was performed by women. Today, these are often made with plastic bags, another victim of the plastic bag ban, along with bin liners. If you wanted to get a bit fancy, Patterns could be added to the poi by applying strips of kia leaf and dyed fibre, as well as power shell. Kuri here could also be added, making the poi a poi awe, ornamental poi, awe being the hair from the dog's rump. This same looping technique used to make poi could also be used to make fish traps and bags for carrying hand weapons. Another fish-related item, this time made through Raranga, were kete kāwhiu, diving baskets. These were designed to hold kaimoana when diving for pawa and other shellfish, whilst also letting the water and sand pass through them. Twining was another technique which was used, this time to make eel traps, sometimes from supplejack vines rather than harakeke though. The way to do this was to place two manuka posts in the ground and wrap the vines around them to make an oval base, continuing up and up to make a series of rings. Young manuka stems would then be twined through them 
to give the trap more strength. Hinaki, as these traps were called, could be very tall or long, depending on your perspective, getting up to the same height as a person. They were often used as a baited trap, with an inverted funnel like you see on some modern traps today. Taruke, or crayfish pots, were made in a similar fashion along with white bait traps, which had a distinctive zigzag shape in Rotorua and Taupo. Moving on to the more domestic sphere, whakari, floor mats, held a special place in Māori culture both as a practical product and one of spiritual significance. In the practical sense, they were placed on the floor of a whare or a whare nui as insulation and for comfort. Generally, there was a form of underlay made of fern fronds, which was placed on the floor first before a tūwhara, a coarse and quickly woven mat, was placed on top. A finer mat may be placed on top of that if it was a special occasion. These mats could also be used for protection of food in the hangi, placing them on top of the food before being covered in dirt to roast them. On the spiritual side of things, whakari were used for all sorts of tasks, such as underneath important guests sleeping on a marae, or under the body of the deceased during a tangihanga, funeral. They were also put underneath the couple during a wedding, or in the house of where an important baby was due to be born. These mats could range from the coarse, quickly made ones we mentioned before, to the ones that had a more spiritual job, having patterns from dyed harakeke or kiakia to symbolise certain aspects or values of Māori culture. Within the marae, in between the whakaira rako, you will see what kind of looks like boards with a cross-stitching pattern on them. These are tukutuku panels, and seem to have been used to disguise the kākaho thatching, made from the stems of toitoi, used for insulation. It is thought that tukutuku may have started out undecorated, and eventually Māori decided to utilise the free space for some decoration, using a lashing type technique to create patterns. The way tukutuku was made was by putting a bunch of wooden slats close together on a frame, leaving just enough of a gap between each slat to pull a thread through. The patterns though is what makes these panels amazing. Potama, or the supportive one, is a steers pattern of alternating colour that appears to move diagonally up and across the panel, symbolising the attainment of aspirations. I recently saw a tukutuku panel with this pattern on it, and it was situated in a school, which I thought was a very appropriate place to put it. A variation on this comes from Ngāti Paro on the east coast of the North Island, which has the steps mirroring each other and making a sort of pyramid in the centre. There is also kaukau, armpits, a pattern dedicated to two mata and resembles a wide rib-like pattern often being placed next to the carvings of tūpuna that were soldiers. Other patterns include roi mata toroa, or roi mata turuturu, albatross or falling tears, signifying misadventure or disaster. Pura pura fetu symbolises lots of stars, sometimes referring to population numbers. Niho tanifa represents the chiefly lineage from a deity. Mumu is a checkerboard pattern from Wanganui representing tribal alliances. Takitoru represents home ties and communication, and so on and so on. There are so many patterns and meanings behind them that we would be here all day talking about them. But I hope you get the idea that these were used not just to hide insulation, or as a nice alternate pattern and texture in the Farinui wall, although they were certainly that too. They helped add to the story of the carvings they stood next to, adding more symbolism and meaning to them in a different way, in the same way you may read art in the western sense. In the modern era, tukutuku have also been used in a lot of churches that have a predominantly Māori congregation, depicting Christian iconography. Just before we move on to clothes, let's talk about a cool little item you may not have heard of, called the kawe which was made of two long harakeke fibre bands. These two bands were made with the fiddy technique and connected by a cross band also made of fibre. Kawe were a neat way to carry heavy loads in a similar way that you see in other cultures across the world. The kawe 
would be laid on the ground and the load that needed carrying laid on the cross band, with the longer parallel bands it connected pulled around the load and tied together to make loops. The loops wouldn't be tied tight though, as the carrier would sit in front of the kawe and put their arms through before standing up. The load would then sit against the back of the carrier, supported by the kawe harness. An awesome and really useful device that was deceptively simple in design. Weaving was used for a number of different items that had a number of different purposes. The main event though, so to speak, was the clothes. In my opinion, more than any other woven object we have discussed thus far, garments is where harakeke and weaving really showed what they were made of. And in the case of kākahu, cloaks, Māori culture certainly agreed, holding the finest cloaks in high regard. We aren't going to jump quite there yet though. First, let's talk about some of the other things Māori were wearing. In the episode on the lives of women, we mentioned that in Māori society, it was considered appropriate to cover one's genitals, and not go showing them off around the pa. Of course, this meant you had to cover them with something. A something called a maro. The maro was worn by both men and women, and at its most basic was a type of loincloth, being triangular pieces of woven flax. They were often ornamental though, with fancy patterns called tāniko, which we will talk about later, and sometimes tassels if you were of high rank. Pre-European samples show that maro were likely woven from bottom to top, that is, from the point of the triangle to the base, and that they were shaped to fit the body as the weaving process went on. Kinikini were similar garments to maro, being a sort of kilt worn around the waist as well, which were used for protection and warmth when travelling across mountainous terrain. Often they were made of mountain grasses that would be readily available when crossing more alpine areas, sometimes using different colours to add an extra flair. Piu Piu was another garment worn around the waist, traditionally made from fibre dangling from a belt, it was another kind of kilt or skirt. This gradually changed with the arrival of Europeans however. Tourism and public cultural events gradually changed the piu piu to become something more decorative, with long, cylindrical flax tubes that made distinctive swishing sounds as the wearer sways. Which is where the piu piu gets its name, the word meaning to sway. You shouldn't have to try too hard to picture these, as all of you, even those overseas, are likely familiar with them, or at least seen them a couple of times. If you think of a person in a typical Māori kapahaka outfit, you are more than likely picturing the person wearing a piu-piu, regardless of whether they are male or female. I'll still put a picture up on the website though, along with all the things we have and will discuss in this episode. Now though, it is time to talk about the big stuff. Kākahu or cloaks? Cloaks were, broadly speaking, split into two categories. Pākia or hiake, raincoats, and basically everything else, which was then further split into categories, based on a variety of different reasons. We will start with raincoats, since they are a bit more straightforward. Pākia were rougher, stronger cloaks, that were made with thicker fibres and more coarsely woven than their other kākahu counterparts. Flax tags would be applied to the outside of the cloak, overlapping to give a sort of thatched appearance and provide the main function. That function, as the name might imply, was to keep the wearer dry in the rain, along with providing warmth. The other group of kākahu is where some of the best work of Māori weavers, both old and new, really comes through. The finest of these cloaks were very prestigious and highly coveted, being one of the signifiers of chiefly status. So they were sometimes used to barter, for things like wakatoa, war canoes, or expert services like tattooing a highly ranked individual. The kākahu that ended up on the shoulders of rangatira were made of the whitest, undyed harakeke for the majority of the cloak, which was weaved from left to right, bottom to top. Like some of the other items we have talked about, after the first line is completed, the cloak would be suspended between two poles to allow for easier manipulation of the fibre. 
Weaving a kakahu was no mean feat, however. It could take years to weave a single cloak, adding to the physical and spiritual value placed on these garments. The bottom edges of these cloaks also often had a taniko, a border that had some sort of pattern on it, which was meant to be both decorative and help give some structure to the edge of the kakahu. Although, if it had a taniko border, it would be called a kaitaka type cloak, in line with typical naming conventions of whatever the main adornment was. The taniko would be the last part of the cloak to be woven, and could include designs of chevrons, oblique lines, as well as vertical and horizontal lines. Today, there is a bit more variety in the styles, colours and motifs, especially with the advent of European contact, such as the addition of the Christian cross, silver fern, or just the letters N, Z to the weaving repertoire, particularly for sale as tourist items. Wool has also been used by modern day weavers as a replacement for Tarniko, given it has been one of Aotearoa's primary and most iconic exports in previous years. Today, Tarniko techniques are also often used for the bodices, headbands, cloaks and other items used in kapahaka, kickstarted by the need for these items due to increasing popularity during the late 20th century. Tarniko borders weren't the only thing Māori liked to put on their cloaks though. Almost anything they could weave into the fibre was added to give the kākahu an extra flair. One of the most popular additions was huruhuru, feathers, and as such, the cloak would be called a kahuhuruhuru. As we know, Aotearoa is the land of birds, so it was only natural that their beautiful feathers featured heavily in the highest quality clothing that Māori wore. Once a bird had been plucked, the feathers were arranged by their size into groups of two or three, and using the gum from flax to stick them together, they were woven into the fibre. Kākahu would require between four and twelve birds, depending on whether you wanted to cover the whole cloak or not. Early cloaks tended to favour more feathers rather than less, sometimes covering the whole surface of the cloak. In the modern day, Feathers are used a bit more sparingly, on account of basically every native species being some form of endangered, especially kiwi and kereru, two species with highly prized feathers. There are modern cloaks made with feathers though, and it's not like people are going out hunting kiwis, so how are they getting a hold of them? Well, like all living beings, birds do die in the natural course of things especially when you have introduced mammalian predators sometimes hunting them. So, by law, any dead native species are automatically the property of the government, specifically the Department of Conservation. As the name might imply, this is the governmental department tasked with bringing back our native birds from the brink and making our country predator-free by 2050. Since all deceased birds are Doc's property, it is actually illegal to hold on to them or take them overseas. However, if you are affiliated with an iwi and have a legitimate use for them, such as weaving them into a cloak, you can apply to be granted the feathers, which is pretty neat. Other items that could be attached to kākahu were niori, pom-pom-like objects that fell out of favour due to being prone to moths, or hookahuka, hooka, which are twisted flax fibre tassels that were often dyed black, making the cloak called a kōrawai. The absolute best of the best and most coveted kākahu though, was the kahu kuri. The kuri, if you don't remember, is the Pacific dog, which Rangatera exclusively owned, so they were the only group that wore this type of cloak. It was distinguished by the addition of tassels of dog fur from the tail woven into the cloak, as well as some cloaks having the dog skin woven on them as well. There may have also been cloaks that were made entirely of kuri skin, although I'm unable to find that many sources on it, but it does sound pretty grim. If you hadn't guessed already, kākahu served a practical and spiritual purpose. They were of course warm and helped protect you from the elements, but they were also worn in battle as a sort of armour. They were more than just utility items though. Given that cloaks were worn close to the body, it was almost as if the mana of the wearer was rubbed off onto the kākahu and carried it with them 
There are also stories of rangatira who would save prisoners by placing the cloak around them as the tapu of the chief was passed on to those he chose to protect, ensuring no harm would come to them. This is of course to say nothing of the fact that cloaks, at their simplest level, were an indicator of chiefly status, which had its own effects on mana, ihi, and wehi. Kākahu serve many different spiritual purposes in the modern day as well, being draped over caskets to represent chieftainship, kinship solidarity, and readiness for the deceased to pass on into the afterlife. Often they are used to indicate Māori ancestry as well, and to accentuate the status of both the wearer and occasion. Many of you will likely be familiar with them from university graduations. Other modern uses include loaning them to non maori of high esteem, such as the current Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern on a visit to Britain in 2018. The kākahu she wore was a kahuhuruhuru, due to it being covered in feathers, not a korawai as it was frequently reported at the time, which we now know has flax tassels as the primary adornment. Another famous kākahu is te mahu tonga, which was gifted to the New Zealand Olympic Committee by the late Māori Queen on behalf of the Māori people. You've actually probably seen it heaps, as it is the one worn by the flag bearer at the opening of each Olympic Games. Next time, our final episode of our look into weaving will take a bit of a detour, taking us a bit further ahead in time from the arrival of James Cook to the 1980s, as we look at the New Zealand flax exporting industry, its rise, its fall, and why it was maybe doomed to fail from its very early days. It was a weird thing I found during my research, and I promise it is a lot less boring than you might think. If you want to send me feedback, ask a question, suggest a topic, or just have a chin wag, you can reach me through email at historyaotearoa at gmail.com or Twitter at History Aotearoa, or Facebook at History Aotearoa New Zealand Podcast. Aotearoa spelt A-O-T-E-A-R-O-A. This podcast is a one-man band. If you enjoy listening to me talk history, you can support us through Patreon, or rate us on iTunes, or your preferred podcast platform. It means a lot, and helps us grow, spreading the story of Aotearoa New Zealand. As always, hari tu atu, hoki tu mai, see you next time.